Okay, so I'm excited to welcome all of you to uh, what looks like will be a great panel on the religious right in Israel and America. And it's exciting to have people joining us from near and from far. Um, and we are going to have three papers. Um, and um, after the papers, uh, you are invited, well, during the papers, you're invited to send questions in the chat and I will receive the questions and then we will have a question and answer period that I will moderate um, in which I will offer questions to the presenters um, and they will answer. So um, without further ado, so as to expedite the proceedings, um, we will begin with Sarah Hirshhorn's paper. Um, Sarah is visiting assistant professor in Israel studies at Northwestern University. Um, her first book, City on a Hilltop, American Jews and the Israeli Settler Movement, uh, was the winner of the 2018 Sammy Gore Prize in Jewish Literature Choice Award. Um, and it was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award and also a nominee for the Grab Meyer Award in Religion. And we're excited to have her here from Chicago. Um, so again, without further ado, I will turn things over to you, Sarah. Great. Uh, okay, Julie, if you could just give me one second, I'm uh, trying to share my screen here so I can uh, show you a bit of a PowerPoint, which is just taking a second to load. I didn't actually realize that I was the first one uh, on deck, but I, while, while that we're waiting to do that, I just wanted to thank you all for um, having me here. Um, I have to have to say a special thanks to the Fulbright Center. Um, this, uh, this book, which originally was based on my doctoral dissertation at the University of Chicago, was actually uh, the original research was funded by the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Fellowship uh, back in 2008. So I feel very uh, uh, um, honored to have the opportunity to present my research here in this setting, only because I feel uh, so much indebted to the Fulbright um, to the Fulbright in Israel and to the Fulbright Program for making this uh, research possible uh, initially. So uh, it is a real pleasure to be with you. Um, hopefully, I'm sharing my screen now. I hope you can see it can everyone can see see the powerpoint is that all right just give my thumbs up or something okay fantastic um well so today i want to discuss uh the findings of my book very briefly in only about 15 minutes so i will highlight only the main findings of my book city on a hilltop american jews and the israeli settler movement which was published by harvard university press back in 2017. Uh, Having lived over the past four years back in the United States, we might hold these truths to be self-evident that there is a kind of deep and dynamic relationship between the Trump administration and uh, the occupied territories uh, mediated often through some of the Trump uh, officials, including the US ambassador, David Freeman, who had both a long political and philanthropic relationship with the West Bank settlement of Beth El, and Trump's uh, son-in-law and chief advisor, Jared Kushner, whose family had also been similarly supportive of the settlement endeavor from the 1970s and onwards. But this book was really uh, about more than a small coterie of top officials in the Trump administration, but the story of over 60,000 American Jews who have settled um, in the West Bank, uh, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai since the 1967 war. Uh, there, uh, origins in the United States, what propelled them to choose to live their lives at the heart of the Israel-Palestine conflict, and their role of both settler leaders and cadres within this movement over the past 50 years. Now, if I ask an Israeli audience, which I'm doing today, who they might think would be the most uh, uh, household name American Israeli settler they could think of off the top of their head, I imagine the answer might be Baruch Goldstein, the perpetrator of the 1994 uh, massacre at the Tomb of the Patriarchs or Ibrahimi Mosque in, uh, in Hebron that uh, killed over 29 Muslim parishioners bowed in prayer, wounded over 100 others, and for, in the eyes of many uh, was one of the final nails in the coffin of the Oslo Peace Accord. Baruch Goldstein, of course, represents one vision of the American Israeli settler in the popular uh, in the popular imagination, that of the zealots for Zion, the most radical amongst uh, the Israeli settler movement as a whole, and even those within uh, Israeli society writ large. The other common stereotype we might encounter is what I would call the kind of desperate housewives um, of occupied Scarsdale. We might suggest that those are the uh, back to the land yuppie pioneers on the West Bank frontier 
those who are living a very bourgeois, affluent, um, and perhaps even uh, American suburban lifestyle within the Israeli settler enterprise. Uh, but these two stereotypes, which very much animated um, my book and my study, do not seem to me to be sufficiently complex to understand the role of over 60,000 American Jews who have come, who have come to, set, to live at the heart of the Israel-Palestine conflict over the past 50 years, who have been uh, deeply engaged in both domestic politics and international relations, uh, who have committed shocking acts of terrorism, but have also uh, provided the backbone of both funding, uh, philanthropy, um, and demography to the Israeli settler movement with over, uh, uh, with over 60,000 American Jews uh, choosing to settle amongst this population, which constitutes some 15% of the Israeli settler enterprise, and perhaps upwards of a third of Americans who have moved uh, to, uh, to Israel and the occupied territories over the past 50 years. So they are punching well above their weight, both demographically and politically. And it seems to me that their story was not sufficiently told by uh, falling back on either of these popular stereotypes that we might uh, see in, in the media coverage of the Israel-Palestine conflict, or even to some extent in the scholarly literature. So I wanted to speak uh, very briefly about who these individuals were prior to their arrival um, uh, in Israel uh, after the 1967 war, and then to say a few more words about what their activities have been uh, since, uh, since they came. Um, and again, I'm sorry to do this so very briefly, but since we have three panelists here today and um, this summarizing the findings of a 300 page book in 15 minutes are not so simple, um, I'll try to cover only the highlights here. So I tried to approach the question of who are these individuals and what have they really been doing within the Israeli settler movement in three different ways. The first was the statistical and demographic profile of American Israeli settlers in the occupied territories. The second was to a uh, close examination of their activities within three case study uh, settlements, which I'll speak about a bit later. And the third was a discourse analysis of the kind of rhetoric they have used, drawing from their backgrounds in the United States to both justify and normalize the Israeli settler project to the international community. So I think we'll start here with a brief demographic profile, which is to say, that the American Jews who came to Israel after the 1967 war, and we should say in honor of the moment that this includes the same generation which brought forth the parents of Naftali Bennett, who were members of this larger cohort, although of course they settled in Haifa, um, but not in the occupied territories, but joined a larger demographic trend of after the 1967 war, which is to say the American Jews who later moved to the occupied territories, very much part and parcel of the 1967 war generation in the United States. They are deeply affected and animated by the revolutionary impact of the 1967 war in American Jewish life that completely transformed American Jewish politics, uh, philanthropy, social relations, theology, and other aspects of the American Jewish experience. Um, and they were also very much moved by um, its impact on their own personal, their own personal lives, many of them at the time being uh, young men and women, often in high school or college years at a very, you know, at a budding moment of their lives. They were also young, affluent, uh, highly educated, over 10% of them hold a doctorate, uh, uh, upwardly mobile, and deeply invested uh, in their own self-realization as individuals in the United States. Um, which also included their identity as Jews, which is the most important and salient aspect of their demographic profile is that they were the highest Jewish identifiers of their generation, which is not to say that they were strictly Orthodox in their religious practice, but they were a generation of American Jews who, who deeply identified with a new ethnic awakening, allowing for a kind of hyphenated Jewish American identity, something that only became possible in the late 1960s, coinciding with the time of the 1967 war. Most of their friends were Jewish. They had attended uh, Jewish institutions, Jewish youth groups, synagogues, had some nominal amount of Jewish education, had participated in Jewish ritual and perhaps Jewish dietary law. And most importantly, found that their, their investments in Jew Jewishness grew after the 1967 war. Yet they were also very much members of their 1960s American Jewish 
generation. So if we are going to put the accent on the other side of that hyphen of Jewish American, they, they embrace, they also embrace their American Jewish identities, which is to say they were uh, active in and sympathetic to the uh, so mass social movements of their day, which included the uh, civil rights struggle and um, the war against Vietnam. And in many cases, they not they didn't think of themselves as abandoning their progressive heritage in the United States by moving over the green line, rather acting in the spirit of their own activism in the United States, bringing this legacy to Israel and later to the occupied territories after the 1967 war. So in contrast to the stereotypes that we may have in our minds about who American Israeli settlers are, that they were neoconservatives, that they were members of the radical right, that even perhaps that they were um, all followers of uh, the Jewish Defense League and Rabbi Meir Kahana in the United States. In contrast, I found that most of them were, were uh, card-carrying members of the Democratic Party who have been active in and sympathetic to the left-wing progressive movements of their day and brought much of that background, both of, of, of rhetoric and ideology of the American left to their activism on later on the Israeli right. In a sense, this book is really about um, a twofold identity. Um, as Kevin Avro wrote, this, this, this was a story that was really half about Jewishness in contemporary America and half about Americanness in contemporary Israel. And the question for these, this cohort after the 1967 war was, given who I am, where do I belong? And for many of them, the answer to that question what eventually became over the green line in Israel-Palestine. I just want to speak uh, briefly about three concurrent trends that I saw in the wake of the 1967 war that elevated the saliency of Jewish identity for these American, uh, for these American Jews, and later constituted both what I would call a push and a pull over the Green Line uh, uh, after the 1967 war. The first was the elevation of Holocaust discourse in the United States. I think scholars have very much shattered the myth of the silence around the Holocaust in the decade of the 1950s, but certainly the linkage between the 1967 war and the Holocaust, the possibility of a second annihilation of American Jewry spoke to a generation of American Jews, some of whom faulted their, their parents' generation or their grandparents' generation for not saving enough Jews during the war and saw themselves as carrying a kind of moral burden for the future of Israel. The second that we already mentioned was the ethnic awakening that spread across the United States in the late 1960s, which affected not only Jews, but also with other white ethnics of that of their day, we include, you know, Italian Americans, Polish Americans, Greek Americans, etc. This was the years of the Rocky films and the reinvention um, of ethnic identity in America. And this spurred many Jewish Americans to uh, delve deeper into their American Jewish identity. Um, and even to think about whether their role in the United States would, would, would be uh, allow for the full realization of that identity. The last, of course, which we are um, you know, speaking about once again today and is actually the subject of my new book project, is about uh, the questions of the relationship between the progressive movement in Israel and how many Jewish Americans who have been engaged in the mass social movements of their day found themselves increasingly alienated from their peers uh, in the movement as the contest or the incipient clashes between what I may call black power and Jewish power became increasingly fierce in the late 1960s and 1970s. And for some, although not all, they made the choice uh, to uh, carry their activism with them to Israel rather than to continue to pursue either mass or particularist activist causes within the United States. In fact, many particularist movements in the US like the soon struggle for Soviet Jewry and otherwise were kind of gateway activist endeavors prior to their immigration to Israel. Now, you may be wondering in our last remaining moment, moments, uh, you know, what, what have these American Jews actually been doing since they arrived in Israel? When did they come? What, uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of roles have they taken within the Israeli settler movement? And here I just want to speak very briefly um, about this, the, second, the second half of this project, which was the arrival of this cohort um, in Israel and later for many of them, their move to the occupied territories sometime after their arrival um, in Israel. Uh, primarily between, uh, in the decade following the 1967 war, which was the peak of American Jewish immigration to Israel, a time when over 30,000 Jews, American Jews per year were, were immigrating to Israel, uh, very far off from, from the numbers we see today of mere, you know, 2,000, 2, 2,500 American Jews that uh, make Aliyah today. 
Um, but their arrival in the settlements um, and their participation within the Israeli settler movement was somewhat staggered. And this reflects the development of the Israeli settler movement over time between the 1967 war and our contemporary moment. Between 1967 and 1973, essentially the bookends of the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, there was actually very limited settlement activity in the occupied territories. But we do find Americans in the first two projects um, of that period, the reestablishment of Kibbutz Kfar Etzion and the, uh, and the reestablishment of a settlement in the city center of Hebron. Um, there were also great, uh, great plans for mass immigration of American Jews to the occupied territories. Um, I discussed in the book a very curious document uh, that I found in the Israel State Archives about a plan for Shalom City, Israel by a Baltimore-based real estate developer who envisioned the kind of mass immigration to the occupied territories um, and the very American character of these settlements that Israeli bureaucrats dismissed as out of hand um, in the late 1960s, but actually later came to realization in the three case studies of the book that I discuss, um, that I discuss in depth which included uh, the participation of American Jews at Yamit in the Sinai, a sort of little known story of a collaboration between American, Russian, Israeli, and native Israeli, um, and native Israeli uh, uh, at, at Yamit prior to its, uh, prior to the disengagement during the Israeli-Egyptian peace accord, which offers a kind of model um, possibly for, um, I'm sorry, offers a kind of model for uh, peacemaking that American Jews put forward in, 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 in leaving their homes um, in the interest of um, the Camp David Accords. The second, second model I, I presented was that of Efrat uh, in the West Bank, perhaps the most well-known settlement established by and for American Jewish immigrants uh, that was a partnership between Rabbi Shlomo Riskin um, from the United States and uh, Moshe Moshkowitz, a prominent uh, settler activist that um, has brought into uh, brought into being perhaps one of the most bourgeois settlements in the occupied territories. But one of the questions that this chapter really uh, tries to explore is whether the yuppie trappings of this quote unquote occupied Scarsdale in the West Bank in, indeed reflect some of its political leanings, which I suggest are far more radical. The last case study that I that I examined was that of Tekoa, also uh, in the West Bank, only about 10 minutes from Jerusalem on the bypass roads today, which has been both uh, a model of uh, extreme clashes between uh, between Tekoa and the neighboring settlement, the neighboring Palestinian village of Tekoa, and some of the very, um, you know, the most, some of the, the perhaps the most violent, uh, the violent chapter of this book but also another model for the possibility of religious peacemaking under the spiritual leadership of Rabbi Menachem Fruman, who served as the rabbi and spiritual leader of Tekoa for, for decades until his death uh, in 2013. Uh, in closing, I also briefly wanted to touch on the clash between what I call liberal values and settler realities from the 1990s and onwards, which I saw going primarily into two, two distinct directions. The first, of course, uh, was American-Israeli settler terrorism. Um, Baruch Goldstein, unfortunately, is I'm sorry. Baruch Goldstein, unfortunately, is only one of several prominent American-Israeli uh, figures who have been involved in um, uh, settler terrorist acts uh, since the 1990s, and I think this is one path that American-Israeli uh, settlers have taken, um, which is somewhat a story of losing their liberalism. Uh, in the Middle Eastern context, as uh, Arrow Rappaport's uh, uh, letters from Tilmon Prison, modeled on letters from Bur Martin Luther King's letters from Birmingham Jail, reflects on in a quite uh, interesting manner. But the other path that I've primarily seen American Israeli settlers taking is that of uh, public relations, um, or what I might call translating the policy of the Israeli settler movement from scripture to a soundbite. Um, some, there may in fact be some, uh, some, uh, some of you who recognize the figure uh, on the right who uh, you may see appearing on you know, CNN or other uh, cable news networks, uh, opining on the fate of the occupied territories from a windswept hilltop of the West Bank. And I've very much seen the role of American Israeli settlers in transforming uh, the discourse of the Israeli settler project and trying to insert some of the rhetoric of the American left and of the uh, 
of the social movements in which they were uh, involved in in the United States into the now right-wing project of the Israeli settler movement in the occupied territories, a kind of mixing um, of liberal values with illiberal projects. And unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss some of these quotations, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a, of a flavor of the way um, the kind of discourse analysis of the book uh, worked in trying to uh, examine uh, this unique feature of the contribution of American Israeli settlers to, to this broader movement, which I think ultimately, despite their demographic preponderance and their uh, involvement as both settler leaders and cadres on a political level, I think this, the actual, their, their uh, impact in transforming the public relations of the Israeli settler movement, I think will likely be their most enduring legacy uh, when we reflect with a bit more historical distance. So in closing, I just wanted to suggest some, some conclusions to these unsettled questions about the Israeli settler movement. The first is to suggest this is part of a much larger research project um, about the changing face of the Israeli settler movement uh, since the 1967 war. The American face, of course, is only one new face that appears here. But I think we need to have uh, much more rigorous re research that reflects the dynamic and heterogeneous constituency of the Israeli settler movement and the multiple discourses that exist within it um, 50 years on. The second is the contribution of Jewish American immigrants across the political spectrum in Israel. There's much work, I think, to be done and, and is yeah, being I'm done. Sorry to interrupt, but we, we really need to hold to the schedule and it's very rich material. But if we want to have time for a question and answer, we really need to move on to the next presentation. Um, so I'm very sorry, but I think we need to conclude with one sentence. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. Um, okay, just, uh, just I guess to give uh, one more sentence here, um, I think that there's a lot to be said about Jewish American liberalism and also because I know that we are going to have our keynote speaker uh, momentarily, just maybe my last, my last, uh, my last finding that I want, want to, to discuss is to also suggest that this relates to what our keynote may, may, may speak about later, about this question um, that I was deeply influenced by uh, Professor Shane's book about the question of marketing the American creed abroad and what this means both for American Jews and also for uh, American foreign policy more broadly. So um, uh, I think that there's there's a lot to be said here um, and I guess we will pick it up in the question and answer. Okay. Thanks so much, Sarah. And just again, because we're really pressed for time, I'm just going to move forward to introduce the next paper, which is co-authored by Monty Imbari and Kiro Rubin. Monty is a professor of Jewish studies at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Um, his books include The Making of Modern Jewish Identity, Ideological Change and Religious Conversion, and Jewish Fundamentalism and the Temple Mount. And Kirill Buman um, is the assistant dean of the Graduate School and professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at UNC Pembroke. And he specializes in post-communist and Middle East politics. Um, and he has recently started studying U.S. evangelical public opinion towards Israel, which I believe is going to be the topic of our next talk. And I'll just remind you that you're invited to send questions in the chat. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. And today we're going to discuss uh, our research, Kirill and I, uh, research that we only recently concluded a survey that we conducted uh, that was uh, completed in April, uh, two months ago, uh, um, among uh, 700 uh, evangelicals and born again Christians at the ages 18 to 29. And the survey was a demographically balanced online panel and quotas were used. And the sample provides 95% confidence that the sample error does not exceed 3.7%. And I should say this is part of a, a much larger project that Kirill and I are conducting now on the public opinion of evangelicals toward the state of Israel. And this is our third survey. And we uh, will make some comparisons uh, with the previous surveys. So uh, we, we will have to skip a lot of data, go straight to the point. So the first point I want to make is that the political affiliations and the 2020 presidential election vote of young evangelicals ages again, 18 to 29. And if you can look at the numbers, we typically think of evangelicals as strong supporters of the Republican party. Uh, but when it comes to this uh, age cohort, our survey showed that uh, from, from political affiliation perspective, about 40% uh, of the survey said that they were 
Republicans or leaning Republicans, and about 50% said that they are Democrats or leaning Democrats. And when we asked them, how did they vote in the elections? Uh, about 46 of those who said that they are Democrats uh, indeed said that they voted for Biden, whereas only about 26% of those who said that they are Republicans uh, out of 40, yes, 26% said that they voted for Trump. And this is an interesting observation. We certainly could say that young evangelicals are not as strong Republicans as maybe their uh, parents or their grandparents are. Um, how religious are the evangel are young evangelicals? So in terms of church attendance, we, uh, uh, this, those who participate in the survey, about, about uh, church attendance, about 63% said that they attend uh, church services at least uh, once a month. And remember, this was a COVID year, uh, which was maybe not so accessible. Uh, in terms of Bible readership, uh, about 50% of the samples said that they read the Bible on at least a weekly uh, manner. So these are relatively high levels of uh, religious engagement. And when it comes to their eschatological views, uh, uh, our survey showed an interesting uh, trend, which uh, we saw also in our previous research, in our previous surveys. So typically when we think about evangelicals, we think about this eschatological uh, point of view, which is called premillennial dispensationalism. This is very important when it comes to uh, their attitude toward Israel, because uh, premillennial dispensationalism allows a room for an independent uh, Jewish state before the second coming of Christ. Uh, in our previous survey, we already noticed that premillennial dispensationalism is not the only uh, type of eschatological point of view among uh, evangelicals, though, was dominant. But when it comes to young evangelicals, premillennial dispensationalism is the, basically is called the lowest with only 21%. The most prominent point of view, eschatological point of view was amillennialism. And I cannot really have the time now to explain it, but uh, amillennialism is not so favorable, doesn't see any special role for Israel in the end days. So we have to make this also take this into account. So the support for Israel um, uh, between two surveys. Uh, in 2018, we asked the following question. In relation to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, where do you place your support? We repeated this question also in our 2021 survey. As, as you can see, these are all the young cohorts. What you see here is apples to apples. In 2018, about 69% of the survey said that they support Israel over the Palestinians with a very small uh, numbers that said that they support the Palestinians over Israel, yes? But if you look at what happened in 2021, you will see a reversal of opinions where only 33% uh, of the sample said that they support Israel over the Palestinians, where 24% said that they support the Palestinians over Israel. And we see a very large block of 42%, they said that they support neither. We're going to try to get to, um, to explain this in, in a few minutes. Um, we asked another question. Do your religious beliefs influence how you perceive Israel, Palestine, or the Israeli-Palestinian dispute? And interestingly, 44% said, no, my religious beliefs have, le have little to do with my assessment of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. It's almost half of the sample. Basically view this Israel-Palestine from a political point of view and not from a religious point of view. About 38% said that their religious beliefs makes them more supportive of Israel. And 17% said that their religious beliefs make them more supportive of the Palestinians. The, fo the following question uh, that we asked was open end, an open-end question where they, the participants had to type an answer. And we asked them to explain why they support Israel or Palestine or none. And, uh, and we coded the answers. And so those who said that they support Israel, again, 33% of the sample, 60% uh, of them gave religious reasons, like that Jews are God's chosen people or God will bless them if they will support Israel. About 20% of the sample gave political reasons. And 21% of the sample 
could not really explain why. We call this the gut feeling. They just, they, there's a gut feeling that they need to support Israel. They really cannot articulate it in words. But when we check those who said that they support the Palestinians, about 50%, 48.4, gave political reasons. 11, almost 12% gave religious reasons. And look at the number of 40% said that it's just a gut feeling. So you look at this young generation, young, they're, 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 they're developing their views based on impulses and gut feelings on this, uh, on this question. Those who said that they support neither, basically most of them could not really articulate an explanation, just that I don't know. Okay, so uh, one thing that we saw in common with the older cohorts and the younger cohorts in the 2018 and in 2021 is the question over Jerusalem. So um, we asked which of the following most closely reflect your opinion of the governing of governing Jerusalem, and 70, almost 72 percent of the sample said Jerusalem in its entirety should be the capital of the state of Israel, and its governance should not be shared with the Palestinians. So basically, and this this there is a consensus among the evangelicals on Jerusalem, and it's interesting to pay attention to that. Um, now I'm going to go to the following question. How, do you, how often do you hear the evangelicals talking about the importance of supporting Israel? As, as you can see, the numbers, the numbers are not that high. Those, but there is a small group, about 12%, who told us that they hear about Israel every week. And I want you to remember this number, this 12%, because it is a significant number, and we're going to talk about it momentarily. Now about uh, Israel treating the Palestinians and the Palestinian state. So we asked on a scale of one to 10, which one begin, is being completely unfair and 10 being completely fair, how do you think Israel currently treats the Palestinian in the Palestinian territories? And what you can see in the graph is that it is about, a, about 40, 41.5% of the sample said that Israel treats the Palestinians well, fairly, 35% uh, said that they have no opinion, basically, and the rest said that Israel was not fair. So if you feel the, the opinion of the young evangelicals toward this question, you see that they think Israel is pretty fair with the Palestinians. And when we ask them the following question, do you favor or oppose the establishment of an independent Palestinian state on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip alongside Israel, we, we saw that about 45% uh, said yes, that they do want a, a Palestinian state. They support the idea of Palestinian state. So what we see here is that uh, although they think Israel is relatively fair, uh, they still support the idea of establishing a Palestinian state uh, in Palestinian territories. Now, uh, well, I can't see it now my screen. Uh, we, asked, uh, we asked an open-end question uh, to the participants, and we uh, and we told them that sometimes uh, previous research showed that uh, there is an age uh, difference between young and old evangelicals, and then and we asked them wh what why must be the case in your opinion, and I sorry I couldn't read it completely because I, something is blocking my screen, and they they had to type an answer, and then we coded the answers. And so one very prominent response that we got is, was about uh, knowledge, meaning that uh, those who participate in the service said that younger evangelicals are less knowledgeable about Israel than older evangelicals. This is why you see this generational difference. It's because of knowledge of Israel's history and also knowledge of the Bible. But the most common answer that we got was about the generational difference, meaning that young people and old people think differently about different subjects. And there is an objective difference uh, of opinions on multiple levels between young people and old people when it comes to what is just and what, how to understand the Bible and an and overall difference between the generations. And I think this is the most important uh, thing that we learn from our responses that there is young evangelicals truly believe that there is a strong difference between them and the older cohorts. And Kirill will continue from here. <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. Um, so as Moti pointed out, on the basis of these descriptive inferences, we wanted to consider some hypotheses that we could test with proper statistical analysis. And I'm not going to go over all of these hypotheses here, but uh, you could basically see some of the variables that we've considered, including eschatology, uh, belief uh, whether there's an internal covenant with the Jewish people or not, democratic party ID, uh, Palestinian treatment, uh, opinion of Muslims, and you can see the rest over here. Uh, we conducted an ordered logit analysis with robust standard errors and sampling weights to get uh, accurate results. We've also added a couple of demographic control variables. And uh, uh, the results, the statistical results, really provided some, some really novel findings for us and contrasted with some of our findings from the previous research. Moti, if you can go to the next slide. All right, so I know it's a little bit difficult to see on the left-hand side of the screen, you have a table with statistical results uh, of particular interest would be the odds ratio column, because that could be interpreted as the actual impact of the specific independent variable on support for Israel. And the way to read that is anything above a one is a positive influence on support of Israel. Anything below, below a one is a negative influence. And as you can see, uh, most of the variables that we've considered, uh, as, as we kind of expected, uh, are statistically significant at acceptable levels. Uh, but there are some counterintuitive and interesting findings that we did not ex uh, expect. Um, I'll kind of linger on the slide for just a second so you have a chance to look at, uh, at these variables and at uh, the sort of basic description of the results. And then we'll go into the next slides, uh, which, We'll, we'll have a little bit of a discussion of this of these specific findings. Okay, Moti, go ahead. All right. So, uh, of of the all the statistically significant variables, the three most significant impacts were related to post millennial eschatology. Uh, both amillennialism and post millennialism were significant, and uh, both of these types of eschatological views are distinguished from the dominant premillennial view in the evangelical community by their adherence to replacement theology. Essentially, this belief that uh, Israel and the Jewish people no longer matter for redemption and for the end time scenario. And as you can see, support is reduced by close to 59% uh, by uh, the adherence uh, of uh, post-millennial eschatology versus adherence of other eschatological uh, traditions. Uh, belief that there is no internal covenant with the Jewish people, uh, reduced support for Israel by close to 40%, and identification with the Democratic Party uh, reduced the support by 36.1%. Um, we saw really dramatic and big findings with uh, religious support for Israel variable, but that's really a control variable more than anything else. And I could discuss that in a little greater detail if you're interested uh, in the Q&A. Um, so one of the findings that really piqued our interest uh, was the socialization variable. In 2018, we conducted a survey with 1,000 evangelical respondents of all ages, and we asked them how often they, they spoke with other evangelicals about the importance of Israel to Christians. And we found that at statistically significant levels, that uh, socialization with pro-Israel evangelicals had a very strong positive effect on respondents' support for Israel. To be sure, it increased support for Israel by 54%. But in 2021 sample of young evangelicals, we find something completely opposite we find that there is a statistically significant negative impact. In other words, the more frequently a young evangelical a born again Christian is exposed to pro-Israel messages, the more likely he or she to express lower levels of support for Israel by 19.4%. So this is a fairly significant uh, finding and a fairly significant reduction in support. We're not entirely certain uh, as we're just beginning to unpack all of this data, but two major hypotheses uh, kind of stand out, or two speculative inferences stand out. One could be the sort of almost teenage angst where they're rallying against the evangelical establishment, which is rooted in the premillennial uh, eschatology. The other is a potential church pastor selection effects. We found in 2020 survey of evangelical pastors that amillennial and postmillennial pastors tend to be more ethnically diverse and, and younger. 
And we believe that it's uh, quite possible that younger evangelicals are gravitating to these more diverse and more, you know, young, hip pastors um, than sort of, I guess, the old guard in the premillennialist camp. And so they're hearing more frequently about replacement theology. They're hearing more frequently about um, importance of treating uh, Palestinians fairly and so on and so forth. And as a result, their support has dwindled. Um, of course, the effect of this socialization variable creates a bit of a conundrum for evangelical leaders. Their most powerful tool is to talk to their parishioners about the importance of Israel. Well, talking about it seems to actually have a negative effect. But one of the things that we found that could potentially allow those politicians or those pastors to reverse the trend is to simply provide information to young evangelicals about Israeli treatment of the Palestinians and to provide information in particular that can show that Israeli treatment is indeed fair uh, of the Palestinian rights and just in relation to the Palestinian concerns. Uh, as you can see, 16.6% uh, increase in support among those respondents who thought that Israel treats Palestinians fairly. Lastly, in all of our analyses in the past, we have not been able to discover any statistically significant relationship between uh, any demographic variables and support for Israel. And in particular, we were really puzzled by our findings or lack of findings for race because some of the literature points to the fact that African-Americans tend to be less supportive of Israel. We haven't found this uh, to be the case until the 2021 survey. In this survey, indeed, we see that African-American respondents were close to 34% less likely to support Israel than respondents from other ethnic backgrounds. We found no commensurate effects for Latinos or any other ethnic groups. I will end with that. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. And our final talk is from Professor David Tal, who is the Yossi Harel Chair in Modern Israel Studies at the University of Sussex, and his book, The Making of an Alliance, The Origins and Development of the U.S.-Israel Relationship, was published by Cambridge University Press in January 2021. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Shalom, Oti. Shalom, Kirin. Shalom, Sarah. Uh, just a, a, a small correction, the book has not been published yet. It will be published in January 2022. Um, on January 19, 1998, uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu arrived in the United States to discuss <coughs> the faltering peace process with President Clinton. As soon as he landed, Netanyahu uh, went directly to a gathering of the Voice United for Israel a coalition of conservative Jewish and Christian organizations. Its organizing committee included Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, and Ralph Reed from the Christian coalition. Netanyahu arrived in the middle of Jerry Falwell's speech, who saluted him as the Ronald Reagan of Israel. Netanyahu appearance, Netanyahu's appearance at the gathering elicited mixed responses. To start with, President Clinton did not like it. Jerry Falwell was considered an outright enemy of the president, and it was reported that in his meeting with Falwell, Mr. Netanyahu apparently angered President Clinton, quote unquote. Members of the Jewish community also expressed disdain. It was not so much the evangelical eschatology that uh, deterred American Jews, but their conservative agenda and position on domestic matters, such as school prayer, vouchers for private and parochial schools, and abortion. ADL's Abraham Foxman called Netanyahu's meeting with Felville crude and insensitive behavior. David Harris of the American Jewish Committee describes Netanyahu's quoting of conservative evangelicals as tricky, very tricky. Another HEC official was more rigorous in his reaction to Netanyahu's vi visit uh, at the rally, saying, quote, these meetings with these people at this time under these circumstances were a mistake, unquote. As was his way, Prime Minister Netanyahu was unmoved by the president's disdain and the American Jewish criticism. The evangelical support for Israel and its hold over the occupied territories was important enough for 
Netanyahu to ignore the contentious voices. Furthermore, Prime Minister Netanyahu was not the first Israeli to seek and find paths into the evangelicals' hearts. Israeli officials and diplomats were doing so since the first day, the days of Israel's existence, and considering the way the evangelicals supported Israel, it was not a surprise. Israeli officials and diplomats reached out to evangelical communities across the United States since 1949. Evangelical pilgrims who visited Israel got to meet state officials, in some cases, even the prime minister. Prime Minister Golda Meir, for example, regarded Billy Graham, one of the most known evangelical preachers in the United States and beyond, a staunch supporter of Israel as a true and noble friend of Israel, quote unquote. However, despite the evident friendship of evangelicals toward Israel and the place of religion in fomenting the Israeli-American special relationship, it took quite a while before the evangelicals interest in the Zionist vision had been translated into a meaningful political activity. Since the 1925 Scopes trial, evangelicals turned inward, concentrating on personal sin and self-reflection while refraining from engaging in politics. During those years, mainline Protestants represented by the National Council of Churches, NCC, were the larger, more, more prosperous and more influential group among Protestants. This had changed during the 1960s when the number of church going Americans from New England and the Mid-Atlantic traditional bastions of the mainline Protestantism declined, while Americans from the South and Southwest, most of them belonging to the evangelical churches, began pouring into the churches they built with their growing wealth. By the end, by the early 1970s, the 10 largest churches in the United States were located in the South, the West, and the Midwest, and nearly all of them were evangelicals. Concurrently, there was an increase in the involvement of evangelicals from the apocalyptic and fundamentalist schools of thought in public affairs, and with that, a growth in the number of Protestants belonging to the churches inclined to support Israel. An AGC report from March 1970 had shown that a change was taking place in the Protestants' general attitude toward Israel. The change became most evident during the 1976 presidential campaign. Both candidates, Republican Gerald Ford and Democrat Jimmy Carter, presented themselves as born-again Christians, a claim made by one-third of all Americans at that time. Newsweek magazine depicted the religiosity of the two candidates as an expression of a broader phenomenon and the year 1976 as the year of the evangelicals. And indeed, it turned out that the 1976 elections marked the evangelical movement's transition from the margins of American intellectual, cultural, and political life into the mainstream of American society. As the number of evangelicals involved in politics had augmented, so did the number of Christian Zionists who came from both among grassroots movements as well as within the evangelical elite. This transformation corresponded to the political shift that took place in Israel with the coming to power of the Likud in May 1977. For the Likud government, the linkage between Israel and the evangelicals was not only a matter of political expediency, but also of ideology. Prime Minister Menachem Begin embraced the evangelicals as no prime minister's before being the first prime minister to practice Christian public diplomacy. He was the guest of honor in the Evangelicals International Congress for Peace in Jerusalem in 1978 and made close association with Jerry Falwell, who represented the change in the evangelical movement and its growing involvement in active politics. Begin met with Falwell several times and the front page of Moral Majority Report titled American, America must stand firm in support of Israel, featured a joint photo of Falwell and Begin taken at the prime minister's office. The prime minister was well aware of the concerns and opposition of Jews to his association with evangelicals, but he had a pragmatic response. Quote, if a man or a group reaches out his end and says, I'm a friend of Israel, I will say Israel has strong enemies and needs friends. Jerry Falwell, Reverend Falwell, is a very strong friend of Israel. 
unquote. But there was more to it. The Likud prime ministers regarded evangelicals as allies in the fight against those who sought to dislodge Israel out of the occupied territories, mainly the West Bank. Jerry Falwell and his fellow Christian Zionists cherished Menachem Begin's advocacy of greater Israel, and they remained close to the Likud governments that succeeded him, seeking to prevent further Israel withdrawals from cities in the West Bank. Jerry Falwell promised to mobilize 200,000 evangelicals to lobby Congress to stop pressure on Israel to cede any more land to the Palestinians. On April 18, 1997, a group of evangelical leaders, which included Jen Hagee, pastor of the Cornerstone Church in St. Antonio, Texas, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson published an ad in support of United or United Jerusalem. The leaders who claimed that they were communicated weekly to more than 100, uh, to 100 million Christian Americans stated that Israel should retain sovereignty over the entire city of Jerusalem. The ad included the slip for their supporters to fill out and to send to President Clinton, demanding the president to acknowledge Israel's biblical mandate over Jerusalem and not to press Israel to concede to the idea of dividing Jerusalem. The Protestant pastor and evangelical, John Hagee declared at the annual IPA conference in 2007, quote, the sleeping giant of Christian Zionism has awakened, unquote. Nearly a decade later, Hagee announced, on that, announced that his church would donate $1 million to Israel and the money would be used mainly for the resettlement of the Soviet Jews in the occupied territories. Hagee interpreted the arrival of the Soviet Jews as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. When asked if he realized that settling Jews in the occupied territories contravened the official American policy toward the settlements, Hagee replied, quote, I am a Bible scholar and a theologian, theologian, and from my perspective, the law of God resents the law of the United States of the United States State Department, unquote. In gratitude for his support for Israel, John Hagee was invited to take part in the ceremonial relocation of the US Embassy in Israel in Jerusalem in May, 2018. On his side was another controversial evangelical pastor, Robert Jeffries, the head of the First Baptist Church who had a long history of support for Israel and delivered a prayer at the ceremony. The presence of the two, mainly Jeffries, also marked the change in the structure of the relations between Israel and the United States, or more specifically, the relations between the Netanyahu government and the United States, and the place of the evangelicals within those relations. The presence of Hagee, and especially in Jefferson, marked the strong linkage between the evangelicals and President Donald Trump, who ordered the relocation of the embassy. The link was the basis for President Trump's staunch support for Israel, as was the case with his predecessors. It only helped that Trump's vice president, Mike Pence, and his secretary of state, Michael Pompeo, were both evangelicals. While from the first days of the Israeli-American alliance, the relations between the two nations were a bipartisan manner, matter, the triangle Netanyahu-Trump evangelicals marked the change in the nature of the Israel-American relations, and they became partisan. This was, to a great extent, the almost single-handed achievement of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Almost naturally, the evangelicals were closer to the more conservative Republican Party, a fact that became clearer during the presidential campaign of 1980. Even before that, the support of the evangelical President Carter was conditional. They criticized his pressure on Israel to apply Resolution 242 on the West Bank. A petition signed by pastors and laypersons asked Carter, quote, as a Bible believer to recognize by your actions and statements that God has given Israel title deeds to Samaria and Judea. Every Bible believer knows it, unquote. The signatories made it clear to the president that his re-election prospects were dependent on your attitude with respect to God's word and Israel, quote unquote. Carter, though, distinguished between religion and politics. While accepting the Jewish attachment to the land of Israel, he rejected the idea that political borders should be drawn based on the Bible. His attitude to Israel, as the evangelicals saw it, 
was only one reason for the evangelicals' disappointment from President Carter. During the 1980 election campaign, they supported Ronald Reagan, who embraced him. In August 1918, in Dallas, Reagan told a gathering of 15,000 Christian leaders, among them Jerry Falwell, Clark Robertson, and the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, all stone supporters of Israel. Quote, I know you can't endorse me, but I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing, unquote. The identification between Reagan and the evangelicals did not affect the bipartisan nature of the Israeli-American relations in general and the Likud evangelical relations in particular. Um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're really going to have to, uh, because of delays on our side, we have to conclude the panel in one minute. Um, and I'm extremely sorry, and it's our fault because there have been changes in the schedule which created problems. So if you could give us one sentence to wrap up, um, and then I will thank all of you and we'll conclude the panel. Yeah, well, the, the one sentence will be that, uh, just let me move to, uh, to see, essentially the one sentence will be that both sides, the Likud and the Evangelicals, for the Likud and the Evangelicals, the alliance seems natural, even if there are various unnatural elements in this bond. There is expediency and pragmatism certainly on the Israeli side. However, no less important is the ideological bond that ties the two parties together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Sarah, David, Malti, Kirill. And again, I'm extremely apologetic that due to time management problems and changes in the schedule on our side, there actually is no time for question and answer. Um, you've given us so much to think about and people who have questions should feel free, obviously, to contact your speakers uh, by email and all the other technological means available to us. But unfortunately, the constraints that technology place on us mean that we need the Zoom account for the next panel. So I'm very sorry. And thanks to all of you. And hopefully we'll meet and in person at some point soon.